Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. I have great news for everyone here today. We made it. January is behind us. We have just entered the shortest month of the year. And with a little luck, official groundhog, Mr. Punxsutawney Phil, will not see his shadow tomorrow, and we will be delivered into spring sooner than you know. But for now, there is a chill in the air. Uh, I can promise you some warmth today uh, from our guest, uh, and we are so pleased to host Jamaican artist, Ebony G. Patterson. A big thank you to our key partner today, as this program is presented in partnership with the Institute for the Humanities, an ever faithful friend to the series, uh, with additional support from Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Uh, just to keep things interesting and to add some geography uh, and to make you go out and walk in the cold for one block, uh, there uh, will be a, the, today's event is a progressive event. So uh, following the talk here on stage, we will not have our normal Q&A. Instead, we will uh, reconvene at the Institute for Humanities Gallery, uh, which is just up the street and around the corner uh, on Thayer, the corner of Thayer and Washington. Uh, and there, uh, they have mounted an exhibition of the speaker's work entitled Of 72, considering the 2010 Tivoli incursion in Kingston, Jamaica. It's beautiful and colorful and you must go. Uh, we love this opportunity to offer a deeper engagement and uh, big kudos to Amanda Krugliak, the Institute's uh, ardent curator for her work. Uh, in light of the exhibition, as I said, there won't be a regular Q&A. Join us there. And two quick announcements. Tomorrow at noon at the Ann Arbor District Library, one of our wit visiting artists, Paul Mavridis, cartoonist, painter, and member of Zap Comics, uh, will be giving a talk at the library at noon. That's free, as all our events are. And then next week, we have another special event uh, before we convene back here on Thursday, and that will be on Wednesday evening at 5.30 p.m. at Rackham Auditorium in the big auditorium. We will host Joseph Keckler, who has been on this stage here before and is also one of our Stamp School alums. He's just published a book. He'll be doing, he'll be performing and reading from his new book. Uh, again, 5.30 on Wednesday at Rackham Auditorium. Please do remember to turn off your cell phones. And welcome uh, Institute for Humanities curator Amanda Krugliak for a little background on our artist. Hi. <laughs> Ebony Patterson was born in Kingston, Jamaica in 1981. She began her first studies there at Edna Manley College of Visual and Performing Arts, and then studied at Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. She has taught at the University of Virginia and is currently an assistant professor in painting at the University of Kentucky. From 2001 to the present, she has been recognized widely for her work internationally Notably, in 2006, she received the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence in Art and Culture in Jamaica. This is the highest award a young person can receive in arts and culture in her country. She received a 2015 Joan Mitchell Foundation Award. In 2017, she was an artist in residence at the Rauschenberg Foundation. And last month, she was awarded a 2018 United States Artist Fellowship in the Visual Arts. Her work has been exhibited extensively in the United States, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Atlanta Center for Contemporary Art, SCAD Museum of Art, Savannah, the Museum of Art and Design, New York. And in November 2018, she will have a one-woman show at the Perez Museum of Contemporary Art in Miami. I don't know Ebony G. Patterson very well. We've emailed a few phone calls. We had noodles for lunch today, and we tried on sunglasses. But I deeply respect her work over these years about gender, sexuality, race, visual culture. And it's simply a great moment to be able to bring her work here 
and Ebony herself this evening. And in all that, there is something that speaks also to the work, that process. We may not know each other, paths cross, or maybe not. February 1 is a blip in time, here and then gone, leaving an imprint as significant as insignificant. The images in the installation of 72 commemorating those lost at the hands of police violence and corruption during the Kingston riots in 2010. These faces are as iconic as the portraits of saints and as anonymous as someone in line we befriend at the market, as ephemeral as the glint of jewels as poetic as the gesture of a hand, as heartbreaking as the belonging of a loved one, or the smell of cherry tobacco that brings back the memory of our father. Imprints of those loved, painful histories, the rewriting of histories, the longing for closure, the discomfort we live with knowing there is no such thing, no pat answer, or explanation, or accountability taken even, or redemption. The lost and missing, so many black lives, bodies in space, marginalized men, women, children, even babies, childhoods lost, shoes like ghosts, glass slippers left behind. In the words of Ebony G. Patterson, quote, who were they? What was their favorite color? What did they like to eat for breakfast? What did their voices sound like? What did they smell like? Did they cry out for anyone? End quote. We are left with both the absence of and the presence of. The uniqueness and the everyday of human life, a moment of reckoning for empathy and the inexcusable lack of it, for our seemingly endless capacity to be cruel to one another, and also our capacity to love. It is with great pleasure I introduce to you Ebony G. Patterson. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was really um, moving. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, the Institute of Humanities and Penny Stamps for having me here. Good night, everyone. Um, so first off, you know, I always get asked, what does the G mean in the middle of my name? Um, and so I say it stands for gangster. <laughs> but my mother would say it stands for grace, God's richest blessings. Um, these are my parents, um, Oscar Zephaniah Patterson and my mother, Thelma Varuna Ferguson. Uh, when I told my parents that I wanted to be an artist, my mother exclaimed, you will never make any money until you're, you die. Um, I also said I wanted to be a part-time singer, and at the time, Mariah Carey was the bee's knees, and she said, you think you're going to be the next Mariah Carey? Um, this is a picture with me um, and my father. Um, I feel that a lot of my, uh, so much of my voice uh, was cultivated, of course, because of these two people. Um, my father uh, was quoted as saying to my mother when I would argue back with her as a child, um, allow her to express herself. Don't tell her to shut up. And um, this is a picture with me and my mother. Um, I think in um, this picture, I'm probably about two or so. And in the earlier one, I was probably just one year or so. Um, I did this little painting when I was eight. Um, so I always knew I was going to be an artist. Um, I'd made up my mind a long time ago. Um, and like all children, 
my, my ideas about what I wanted to do with my life, um, there was always an additive. So I was gonna be an artist and, an artist and this, um, but I always wanted to be an artist. And so in many ways, I'm living uh, a childhood dream. Um, my parents both grew up in deep rural poverty um, and had no idea about what it meant to be an artist. And so in many ways, they dared to allow me to follow my dream, even though they didn't understand um, what that meant or what that would mean. In 2010, I lost one of my rocks, my father, my daddy. Um, and this uh, shifted a lot of my practice significantly. Um, it was also the first time I started to talk about uh, death in my work. Um, so up to, this, uh, at, up to this point, I was, a lot of my work had to deal with ideas primarily around fashion and bling culture. Um, but I think after my dad had died, it shifted um, a lot of the undercurrents within the work and looking more actively at dress as a kind of political response um, for those who are invisible. Um, in 2010, I took a photograph or I staged a photographic moment to try to commemorate or to begin to process uh, the passing of my father. Um, this work is called Dead Daddy. Um, it's about six feet by about, uh, it's about six and a half feet by, by about four and a half feet. And it's a jacquard woven tapestry, very much like the one that's on the floor in the uh, gallery. Um, that's then embellished, and then it is hung on top um, of wallpaper. It took me about two years um, to decide or to kind of bring this work to fruition. It, and it also took me a while to realize uh, how much death or the conversation around death or memorialization uh, began to enter my work. The very year that my father um, uh, took sick, and at the end of the year he died, um, that summer when he fell sick, um, Jamaica had come under uh, martial law. Uh, so we were under a state of emergency. Um, the figure who you see, uh, the man who you see on the screen is Christopher Koch. And Christopher Koch was a kind of informal political figure um, that was being sought for extradition to the US um, to face gun and drug charges. Um, Coke was also um, a kind of informal political figure in the community Tivoli Gardens. And so Tivoli Gardens is a working class community situated in West uh, Kingston. Um, and like, uh, and like many working class communities in Jamaica, it's quite often that you have these kind of uh, informal uh, political uh, figures. And many of them are usually involved in illicit activities. But what would cause someone like Coke um, to rise um, in a, a community like this has a lot to do with uh, the lack of trust for governance um, or in governance, and also it, it also indicates um, how much neglect also happens on the part of persons who are elected officially to serve these communities. Um, these are shots of Tivoli during the period of the incursion. So when the incursion had happened, um, Coke had gone into hiding. And essentially, uh, security forces had gone into the community in an effort to extract him and extradite him. During the time that he had entered, uh, during the time that the security forces had entered the community, several people were murdered. And I, and I don't use that word lightly. Some people use the word killed, um, but in many ways, it was murder. Doors were kicked off by security forces. Young men strategically were, uh, were targeted and profiled, arrested, and several of those people were killed. This happened in 2010. It wasn't until 2015 
um, that there was an inquiry that was uh, a, a public in inquiry that had happened uh, by way of the government because of significant public pressure. 72 was a reoccurring number at the time um, in 2010 of the numbers of people who were killed. It was believed that the numbers were actually twice or more than that. There were a lot of questions about the way bodies were handled. There were a lot of questions about the way the security forces chose to extract people um, and detain people. And there were a lot of questions about who was being targeted. So then what does it mean then for particular bodies, working class people, predominantly uh, dark-skinned, poor people, to be arrested so easily for their lives to be taken so easily without any question? To this day, the government has never formally acknowledged the names of those people who were killed. So these people's names were neither in the murder toll nor were they in the death toll. It's almost as if they never existed. And then what does it mean for particular lives? Because they come from a particular socioeconomic background, for them not to be acknowledged, that somehow those lives have no value. So during the time uh, the incursion had happened, I was home. I would hear uh, mothers, wives, girlfriends, daughters, sisters, calling into radio stations, asking for political intervention, calling for their political leader, their official political leaders, to intervene because the security forces were essentially killing them, murdering them. It was frightening. So in an effort to commemorate, at the time, I started this work in 2011, the names still were not public. And the number 73 to 76 uh, were the new numbers that were kind of passed around in uncertainty for many years. It wasn't until the inquiry that the number, it had, uh, it had been revealed that the number may possibly have been much higher. So in an effort to commemorate and to raise questions, not just about Tivoli, but also about people who come from communities like Tivoli, I chose to make the work of 72. At the time in the official reports, it was 72 men and one woman. So even in the numbers, it made it very clear who was being targeted. I remembered reading a mother's account about two of her young sons. One was 16 and one was 17. The police force kicked off the doors, took her two boys out. She pled for them, saying that they were not involved in anything. They didn't know who Coke was. They carried them up the road. Shots were fired. The eldest of the two ran past his mother, saying, Mommy, they just killed his brother's name, and then the police cut him down in front of his mother. So for your life to have so little value and to be seen as so little, simply because of where you are born, um, is deeply unsettling. And so I chose to make this work not just to memorialize this occasion or this moment in our history. Um, sorry. But in the hopes that it would also anchor a sense of value in the bodies that were absent and unacknowledged. So within the work, um, formally you'll see that there are these haloed forms Right, so likening that to, or, or making references to religious uh, painting or religious uh, symbolism that one would often see in um, iconographic or med medieval paintings. 
Um, but then at the same time, there's also this kind of bandana structure that's used around all of them. Again, anchoring uh, these faces or these bodies uh, within the stereotype uh, that would be associated um, with bodies that come from spaces like this. And then um, they're all highly embellished. Um, the faces are also masked. So again, that reference is the anonymity, um, the anonymity of these particular bodies that have not been acknowledged. Um, and at the time, I hadn't had any access to any particular images of the people who were actually who had actually passed. So I was using images from public databases, um, from public criminal databases. So hence the reason for the mugshot format. So again, using all of the stereotypes uh, associated with the way poor bodies or poor black bodies or just black bodies um, are often seen or understood in public space. So there's this poem called Brief Lives that I was introduced to um, when I start, as I started to develop another body of work. Um, and the poem was written by a Jamaican poet, Olive Senior. And it says, gardening in the tropics, you never know what you'll turn up, quite often bones. In some places, they say, when vol um, volcanoes erupt, they spew out dense and monumental as stones, the skulls of the desaparecidos, the disappeared ones. Mine is only a kitchen garden, so I unearth just occasional skeletons. The latest was of a young man from the country who lost his way and crossed the invisible boundary into a rival political territory. I buried him again so he can carry on growing. Our cemeteries are thriving too. The latest addition was a, was a drug baron who had this stunning funeral complete with 21 gun salute and attended by everyone, especially the young girls, faved, famed for the vivacity of their dress, their short skirts, and even briefer lives. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about Olive's uh, about Senior's poem is the fact that there is this moment where two social classes kind of collide. So gardening is a very middle class or um, kind of upper class activity. It's a kitchen garden, so we understand that this is a garden that might be quite modest. There's a second moment that happens where she talks about this young man who clearly comes from another social class. And out of reverence for his life, she buries him again so he can carry on growing. The fact that she recognizes, the character in the poem recognizes that this boy's life, this young man's life has value. Even in death, there is this possibility that his life will add to her modest garden or that it may, um, it may spawn new possibilities. So in Jamaica, there's been a growing tradition called a bling funeral. This is an academic term. Um, but a bling funeral essentially is uh, the fusion of traditional funerary practices and uh, dance, or not dance, but popular cultural aesthetics. So a bling funeral typically happens um, in a working class community. So if in the community there is a community matching band, uh, one may hire the matching band to play at the funeral. Um, another thing uh, that they may also do if there's no community matching band, they may hire a music truck that may play popular music of the time or songs that were a favorite to the deceased. Um, another um, another uh, thing that's, that also happens in a bling funeral is that they're usually customized coffins. Um, in this image here uh, is a coffin and the deceased uh, Bogle, who was the godfather of uh, a popular of street dance. Um, 
and if there is if the if the if the family of the deceased also has a lot of money or they have extra money, uh, they may hire or build a chariot um, that will parade the coffin um, from one point to another, whether it be from the uh, church to the graveyard. Um, in the case of Bogle, he had two coffins. Um, one coffin, which was a glass coffin, for two weeks had toured to several uh, parties throughout a couple of working class communities so people could pay homage. Um, and then here's another image with women carrying another customized coffin. Um, but what is really interesting about a bling funeral and thinking about the context that a bling funeral happens in, a bling funeral happens because someone recognize, recognizes or believes that in the life that they had lived, they were not acknowledged or value was not attributed to them. I remember reading an interview that Donna Hope Marquis had done with a woman who was slowly paying down on a coffin at a very popular uh, funeral home in Kingston, she had said, no one may have noticed with me when I was alive, but they will damn well notice me before I leave, right? So she recognizes that because of her social station, she has no visibility. But through this funeral, through her last uh, exit, she's going to make sure that she is acknowledged. So one of the reoccurring themes that, uh, that, that I've been exploring within my work has a lot to do with ideas around visibility and, invis visibility and invisibility. And one of the things that's really interesting to me about a bling funeral is how the funeral is used as a political tool to say, I am here or I was here. So thinking back to the fact that there's a marching band there may be uh, a music truck, so there's a musical procession that leads the funeral. In many ways, we're, we're looking at the structure of a state funeral, right? Something that we would associate with somebody who's a dignitary, some state figure. Um, but here it is, we have people who are, from a, uh, who are typically from working class communities using the, same, uh, using the same kind of model as a way of saying, I was here, and I mattered while I was here. Um, and the other thing that this also looks a lot like too is when you think about a uh, second line funeral, it has uh, similar um, attributes. In 2014, I had staged an intervention into, uh, in the Jamaica uh, Carnival. The Jamaica Carnival is an incredibly, um, uh, Carnival has never been something that's really a part of uh, Jamaica's culture. We have had traditions of masquerade, like John Canoe, which, um, which uh, developed during a period of slavery, but Carnival was never something that was really a part, um, a part of our culture. Um, the Carnival, had started in the late 80s, early 90s. And it is an adaptation of Trinidadian Carnival. Carnival has always typically been, uh, structurally or historically, has always been an act of protest. Unfortunately, in Jamaica, we have not found a way to integrate our cultural traditions of masquerade into uh, this kind of foreign structure that we've taken on. The other thing that's also interesting to me about the carnival is where the carnival happens, what kinds of bodies are allowed to participate in the carnival, and how the carnival operates structurally. So the carnival usually happens um, within middle class or upper class, uh, the upper class section of Kingston. And the bodies that participate in the carnival are usually the same bodies that come from those spaces. All of the costumes are usually priced out in US and in a, a developing economy, uh, currently our exchange rate is 126 to one. That then makes it even clearer what bodies are participating in that, who is in and who is out. There are also moving barriers around the carnival, um, which also makes a very clear distinction about who's allowed in and who 
um, is, al is, not, um, is not allowed to participate. When I, share, uh, when I share this with a lot of my friends in, in Trinidad, they say to me, but mass is for everyone. The idea that somehow you are not allowed to participate in mass, which is what they call carnival playing mass, um, is unheard of. So during the carnival, I collaborated with a number of students at the Edna Manley College. And in thinking about uh, the Of 72 project, I had always wanted to make uh, coffins for everybody. Um, the project was also supported, uh, was, also, uh, was also a part of a project called En Mass or En Mass, which was investigating carnival and masquerade pra uh, practices, um, in, um, practices by artists within the Caribbean. Um, and that was curated by Krista Thompson and Claire Tancons. Um, so for this, uh, for this uh, project, eight artists from the region were invited to stage a performative moment during their, um, during their, uh, during their Islands Carnival. And I, I chose to stage this intervention called Invisible Presence. So as the carnival, the main carnival walked at the um, walked by, when the last of the carnival had happened, I led my procession out um, to follow behind the carnival for a brief moment. We walked with 50 coffins upright. There were no uniformed um, outfits. There were also no barriers, and we were led by a marching band. Um, the St. Michael's marching band that plays typically in working class communities at, all, at um, bling funerals. And the, the, the idea behind the carnival was to create a strong moment of presence and a strong moment of absence because the carnival went on all day. And this is why we only walked for an hour. We carried the coffins on six foot poles. So I want you just to just imagine how ominous that must be seeing fifth, a, a crowd of 50 objects, coffins, just kind of bobbing over the heads of the crowd. I'm gonna play a small, a small clip from the day um, for you guys. My particular socioeconomic group who are not necessarily allowed to partake in the carnival. for this brief uh, moment uh, through the carnival, people who were walking ahead of us started looking back going, what, what's, what's that? What's going on? Um, and so uh, in some ways it was also a bit of a curiosity because um, the carnival that was happening at the front uh, were bikini and feathers, um, while at the back um, we were using the project as a way, um, well, in the traditions of old mass, um, as a moment of protest. Um, so one of the statements that I've always been fascinated by is this one. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? That is very much about the idea of visibility and invis visibility and invisibility. So if no one is around to acknowledge that the tree has fallen, has it really fallen? Um, it's also about witnessing too, in many ways. So around this time, I was also collecting, for some time I've been collecting a number of images um, that were shared online of people who had died violently, particularly um, through social media. I remember a friend of mine um, had shared an image, or actually as his uh, DP pick, had an image of a young boy who was murdered in a tenement. And the, Im the image was actually of the child's uh, 
bullet riddled body. And I asked him, what are you doing? How could you have this image of this person up as your profile picture? What if this was your nephew, your brother, your own son? And he said he didn't even think about it like that. So social media in many ways is a kind of a level playing ground in the sense that it gives everyday people the opportunity to be visible and to compose their visibility, to compose the way they want to be seen or how they should or how they, yeah, how they want to be seen. But what happens then when those same bodies that are being shared are not able to decide that? What does it also mean to depict bodies that have been violated, bodies that are often continually up for consumption, um, to be shared, clicked on, liked, commented on as if they were objects? And so one of the things that I was really interested in was how in many ways social media or the media generally um, kind of flattens our relationship with photographs. So the image or what we see within the image now becomes an object. It is no longer a person. And so I made several works um, in response uh, to these images. So one of the reasons that I often use the kinds of materials that I use, uh, that's the patterning, the glitter, um, the bling, is a way of seducing the viewer into looking at the surface. So at the beginning, one may think that the surface or the imagery is incredibly pretty. Uh, but as one begins to look closer, one realizes that what is within the trappings of the beauty is deeply unsettling. So after making uh, these wall-based uh, wall paintings, sorry, I didn't um, really talk about them, which are from the, of, um, from the Blade series, um, I decided that I would uh, stage a number of uh, photo shoots and then create works that would sit on the floor. Again, referencing or in some ways referencing the way one would experience bodies if they had fallen. So the floor-based works in many ways uh, is not just about the imagery, but is also about the audience engaging those images. These bodies uh, become a moment in a crime scene. But then at the same time, on the surfaces of these uh, floor-based works, they're, all, they're highly embellished. Um, they're objects on the surface. And so in many ways, they seem like a kind of memorial. So the, the works are informed uh, by the photographs that I was looking at online. Um, and then I had made these kind of elaborate uh, photo based shoots that I then, um, after making the photograph, I then uh, had the images woven as a jacquard tapestry. And then I would sit and hand embellish um, all of these works. So again, uh, there is, let me just go back a few, sorry. Um, again, as one looks at the imagery, there is no head. There are no arms. All you're seeing are the clothed moments. And so there are these subtle references to violence within the trappings of the beauty. Um, this particular work uh, is sitting in the gallery. I call it Anne Babies Two. I've always liked the title of the work done by the Art Workers Coalition in response to the Mele uh, massacre due, during the Vietnam War, which was done in 1969. Uh, during my sabbatical period, about two or so years, in, in 2015, um, for the first six months of that year, I spent it at home. Um, but during the six months, 18 children were murdered. 
Of these 18 children, nine were boys and nine were girls. The girls were often, and half of the number of girls were pregnant. Several of these girls were in, uh, well, I don't like to use the word relationship in this case, but they were involved, um, they were, they had, uh, this is not the word I like to use either, let me find the right word. They were being sexually abused. And their parents often knew of the relationship or of the abuse because these were either men who were somehow giving money to the family or giving money to the child that they were sexually abusing. I remember in one case where a young girl was, uh, was pregnant, um, not among these 18 children, and the mother had said that she had told the police about the man and uh, the police did nothing about it. They didn't ar arrest um, the man. But what was incredibly startling to me that every time the names of these, um, every time these cases uh, had come up in the news was that there was always a significant amount of empathy being given to the men who, had, um, who were abusing these, these children. There was never a sense of empathy for the, for the children who were being abused. So it was always, well, you know these young girls, how they are. Um, well, you know, we can't really control these young girls. He was such a good person. Um, and so it's always very startling uh, to me to hear these conversations and to think about these, um, these dialogues, dialogues around these young bodies um, that were victims, that somehow they had participated in their own victimization. Whatever had happened to them was their own fault, their own doing, and not the perpetrator. Um, so I made a, a work. Uh, I had been invited by uh, Tyler School of Art um, to, to imagine a project that I'd always wanted to do. And so during the time I was there, I made a work that kind of commemorated these 18 bodies uh, during the six months that I was home. And so this is also in the gallery. Um, so you'll see this later on um, this evening. So there are 18 pairs of shoes that represent each, uh, each young child. Um, and then on top of that is a tapestry. And the imagery in the tapestry are all things that we would associate with childhood. So toys, um, tricycles, candy, and it's also incredibly uh, colorful. But there's something really ghostly about seeing an object that requires the activation of a body um, kind of just being thrown on top of the surface. I find shoes incredibly haunting. Um, there's something about that being left behind, always wondering who once wore them, what life did they have? And in this case, I wonder about the life of those children. I was invited uh, by the Museum of Art and Design to imagine a project in their uh, jewelry uh, gallery. Um, and so in their uh, jewelry um, gallery, I had decided, very much like what I was doing in the floor-based works, to kind of develop a kind of tableau um, within um, the vitrines. I had, off, I had also worked with, um, worked with a number of objects from the collection. So I built a garden within the vitrines. And inside the vitrines, there was always a clothed uh, body headless, arms decapitated, um, but subtly referencing violence um, throughout all its beauty. Um, all the plants were also poisonous. So I've always been interested in the idea or the notion of gardens kind of being a socio uh, socioeconomical boundary, um, but using the trappings of the garden as a way to lure the viewer in um, to discover um, what's within and to read the clues that tell us about the body that's buried. And also to in many ways, the garden also serves as a reference to the grave. These are some other works on paper also exploring uh, the same ideas. 
So as I moved back to the wall from working on the floor, and especially after doing the vitrines, I decided to do uh, a number of wall-based works, exploring those same ideas. But then on the floor, um, there are these objects that are placed at the base. Um, the colored elements, they're all uh, crocheted leaves. And then the shoes are also handmade, um, customized uh, shoes, meant to be an immediate dialogue um, with the work. So in many ways, these works also become memorials. In 2016, I was invited to do a show at the Studio Museum in their project space. And so the title of the show was called When We Grow Up or when they grew up, sorry, dot, 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 dot. Um, and so I had uh, kind of thought about the idea or thought about going back again to the, uh, to the 18 children who were murdered during the time I was home, the way that uh, young black bodies were often discussed in media. So for example, in the case of the US, when we think about the cases around Tamir Rice, for example, or we think about Trayvon Martin, the language that is often hung on these young bodies is always associated with adulthood. So I give you another example. Ryan Lott, who was 32 during the Olympics, when he and his friends um, or uh, fellow teammates had gone to a gas station, uh, destroyed the property, uh, the Olympics said they were just kids having fun or having a good time. Um, but when we think about uh, someone like uh, Trayvon Martin, he was described as if he was an adult. He was no longer a child um, in the way that he was described. So what does it mean for bodies that are rightly, um, or that are rightly um, supposed to be associated with the language of childhood, um, the language of innocence? Um, not given, uh, they are not given that. And so in the show, uh, When They Grow Up, I wanted to imagine a space that all of us would in one way or another be familiar with, which is a play space, a space of play. So from floor to ceiling, it was painted all pink. Um, and then there were these images of children within the space doing just regular things that we would associate with kids. Um, these, this one here is called They Were Just Boys. These are uh, two boys who are 17 and 18, and they had just discovered a toy that they hadn't experienced before. Um, the shoot that I had staged just had a number of toys, and this was a moment when uh, the kids had just sat on, um, had just sat on the set they saw the toy and they just started picking it up and we started photographing them in that moment, capturing uh, the first moments of discovery and curiosity, which play often inspires. In this one, we see a crowd of children hanging out, talking to each other, laughing, looking uncertain. And in these two, we see a child age 12 and age, and age 18 juxtaposed next to each other. The commonality in all of these images, as beautiful as they are, is that all of them have holes within them. So we can see the holes riddled throughout the imagery here. On this one, the 18-year-old wears something on his chest saying, worthy. So they are all participating in moments that we can all identify with, that we've all experienced. And so by posing these questions or these experiences to the audience, I'm hoping that it will trigger a sense of familiarity. And then at the same time, also raise questions for us about the way we engage with bodies like this. Love, the moment of a first crush. In 2018, I was invited by Barney's 
uh, to, to stage a project for their uh, Christmas windows um, at their downtown flagship in New York. And so thinking about the same ideas around visibility and in, visibility and invisibility, why do I keep stumbling over that? Um, in thinking about those same moments, I, and then also to thinking about the fact that the windows are on the street, um, it's such a, in, in thinking about, uh, about it uh, ideologically, it is an incredibly uh, thoughtful gesture um, for this commercial venture, uh, for this commercial entity or corporation to decide to hire artists who are making work, uh, or at the time were making work, that were all engaged uh, socially um, or politically to stage a thoughtful moment um, in their windows. Of course, it's Christmas, so we all had this weird theme called love, peace, and joy. Um, and so I said I would respond to love since love is like the most abstract um, of them all. Um, so I had, uh, I think it was 24 uh, mannequins that I had uh, decoupaged um, on, this, on their, the skins were totally covered by fabrics. And each of them were customized clothing um, that I had, uh, that I had, uh, had made by a tailor who I'd been working with for years back home, Chris Pablo. Um, and then within the, uh, within the expanse of the window, uh, they all sit within this kind of overgrown um, garden, again, very much like what we had seen um, in the mad vitrines. But then there's also this kind of uh, moment where we're seeing these red hangings that could be rain, it could reference nooses, but it's a subtle moment of violence um, within this kind of beautiful facade. On the street, there are also these speakers, and the mannequins actually speak. They say something. They require something. And so I'll play a short moment uh, from the video for you. See me. 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 Why can't you see me? I'm right here. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me. See me. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me. See me. See me. See me. I'm right here. See me! See me. So the, the mannequins, or rather the figures within the window, ask for something very simple. They ask for acknowledgement. And so in many ways, that is what I attempt to do, or what I've been attempting to do, uh, is to give acknowledgement to those in so many ways have not been acknowledged. So on the screen right now are the list of names that came up during uh, the course, not during the course of the inquiry, um, but a news, uh, an independent news station had done um, an investigative reporting, investigative reporting um, into the Tivoli incursion. I gathered all of the names 
um, that they had, uh, that they were able to find, which I, I think at the time were only 56 names. Um, it was the only uh, public effort not supported by the government at all. In the government's official report, there is still no acknowledgement of all of these people who had been killed during the incursion. So I'll close there, and I look forward to seeing you all at the reception at the gallery. Thank you so much. <laughs>